So I'd just like to introduce Jason to you. So thanks for joining us today to hear from Agriculture Victoria's Biosecurity Manager, Jason Wishart. And he's going to talk to you about some of the state's invasive species and the evolving strategies to manage them. So Jason has been involved in invasive species management and, a res and research for nearly 15 years. He started his career at the Invasive Animals CRC, which is now the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, and then moved to animal control technologies for several years before joining Agriculture Victoria as statewide biosecurity manager for established pest animals. Jason has worked on numerous invasive species throughout his career and has developed several products and strategies to assist with their management. I'll hand over to Jason now and say welcome Jason. Sorry, I just had to unmute. Thanks for that, <laughs> Teresa. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about strategic pest animal management and I'll flip over to the next slide, um, hopefully. Let's see how that goes. Yep. Okay. So it's just a bit slow. So this is a bit of an overview of what the presentation uh, will entail today. And some of you may already know a fair bit about this stuff and some may not, but I think it's a good way to, to recap for some of the people who do know a bit about pest management, but it's, it also provides some, um, I guess, a good baseline uh, for those that are getting into this particular space. So I'll talk a little bit about what is a pest, um, how they arrived here, some impacts they have, and then go into a little bit about the various control techniques that are available for each of the different pest species. Um, talk a little bit about the traditional management approaches and management styles and how that's evolved, I suppose, over the years um, into some of the more modern, modern approaches. And then I'll go into the strategic approach to pest management, which is, is generally the national standard, I guess, for developing a pest animal management plan. So what is a pest? So this is more about um, the dictionary definition rather than the legal definition. So here it is, an animal it can be native or introduced that has um, a negative impact on or cause damage to uh, a valued resource such as the environment, agriculture, industry and uh, people or the communities. Um, so the status of a pest to one person can be uh, different to, to another. Um, it can change between the various areas um, and it can change within time as well. So one, one thing that's a pest now might not necessarily be a pest um, in a couple of years down the track, um, or they may become a pest. So, and like I said, um, a pest to someone may not necessarily be a pest to somebody else. So an, a good example of that is, is the feral goats. Um, feral goats are worth quite a, quite a lot of money. Um, so they're a bit of a resource to some people, whereas others, you know, they can impact agriculture and potentially spread diseases and those sorts of things too. So those differing, um, opinions and interests and, and values can make the management of pest animals quite difficult. So the origin of, of our pests, um, most of them or a lot of them have, um, I guess, been brought to Australia around the time of early European settlement. Um, a lot of pest animals have been brought here. A lot of various um, vertebrate pests have been brought to Australia over the years. Some have established wild populations while, while others haven't. Um, a lot of them were bought by the acclimatisation societies to make it feel a little more like home, so back in England. So those are things like um, deer, for example, various deer species have been brought to Australia for, for hunting purposes. Um, you also had things like various songbirds and those sorts of things too. Um, and then we had others that were bought for sport and for food. So, you know, you'd have your, your rabbits and foxes for sporting purposes and, and for food purposes, it'd be things like goats and, and feral pigs or pigs that turn feral. Um, like I said, many of these have failed, but some really did prosper. Um, and the threat of new incursions is still, is still evident today. And, and we have, um, a department here at, at AgVic that focuses on those those high risk invasives, those new incursions as well. But today we'll stick with mostly the established pest species. So why do pests do so well in 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 Australia and, and other places? Well, they can adapt their behaviour um, to a whole range of different things, but primarily climate. So 
um, in areas where it's quite hot. Um, say feral pigs, for example, will spend a lot of their time in the shade during the day and then become active at night time um, where they can move around. They'll, they'll visit uh, water points and, and those sorts of things. And then other pests and pigs themselves too can, uh, can change their behavioural patterns according to disturbance. So if there's a lot of activity going on in a particular area, they'll, they'll, move, um, they'll move to a new spot where it's a little bit more quiet. Other things that pests have is generally a broad diet. So they'll eat opportunistically um, and they'll eat a range of different, different things. They have generally high, high reproductive rates. So um, say even feral goats, for example, can have, have um, young twice a year. Feral pigs can as well. Um, and, and, and pigs can have up to 12 or so piglets in a litter. And, um, and then you have rabbits that can, that can breed sort of eight to, to nine times a year and have five or six young on average each time. Um, pests can also travel massive distances, um, more so the, the larger, more mobile species like feral goats and, and pigs and uh, even wild dogs, they can travel quite away. Um, the habitats that we have have been modified to suit pests. So we've, in, we've put better quality food into the landscape. We've potentially cleared areas to turn it into grazing country, which is better suited for some species. Um, we've added water points and a whole range of other things to make it better suited. Um, and they have a few natural diseases and natural predators here um, to keep their numbers in check. So our established pest animals, so these are, these are pest animals that are listed under the Catchment and Land Protect Protection Act as established pest animals. Um, so they include feral goats. Now, goat populations in Victoria are fairly sparse, um, but they do occur in some of the the, the um, rangeland areas out to the to the northwest um, and in some of the high country and mountainous areas. We got foxes that are um, right throughout, essentially, uh, even in some of our major cities. So there's even fox populations in in places like Melbourne. Uh, then you got European brown hares as well. They were introduced um, back around the time of early European settlement, again, for hunting um, into Victoria, and they've spread quite a bit, but the, their numbers aren't anywhere near like what rabbits get. And it's probably due to their biology and their ecology. They don't build burrows and things like rabbits do. So they, they have their young above ground and they have them less often as well. Um, feral pigs, they're a, another species that's in Victoria. Um, Again, they're not overly widespread, but they are certainly here in certain areas. And some areas, their numbers are reasonably high and some they're quite low. Uh, feral dogs or, or wild dogs is another one. So these are dogs that have gone wild and then living in, in the wild um, without help from humans. And uh, they, the wild dogs also include um, dingo feral dog hybrids as well. Um, and then rabbits, which is another uh, another widespread and abundant one, much like foxes. So there's various types of damage that pest animals can cause. And one of the big ones is environmental damage. Um, through this, they prey on native wildlife and, and their eggs. So that's direct predation. So foxes, for example, um, and, and even feral cats will, will target various uh, invertebrates um, reptiles and amphibians and all sorts of things. Um, habitat degradation is another one. So overgrazing and selective grazing by things like rabbits, feral goats and feral pigs can actually change the species composition and the habitat structure of certain areas. Um, the ground disturbance that, that feral pigs cause. So feral pigs will dig with their snout in soft soils to, to look for roots and invertebrates and other food sources. And in that in that time, they, they do cause quite a lot of damage. Um, there's an example of that actually in this, this photo, the top photo there of um, pig damage around a waterway. And then that can lead to erosion and, and all sorts of other things which can impact water quality. Um, just, weed dispersal is another one. So some of these pests can carry the weeds on their coats and on their fur. Some of them eat the weed seeds and spread them that way. Um, and others create habitat or environment that suit weed growth. So they disturb the soil or they eat the most um, attractive native vegetation and then the, the less attractive um, weeds or what, what have you or less nutritious 
which they start to take over. And then they in turn provide good habitat as well for the various pest species. Um, erosion too. So a lot of these ones that I've mentioned before, so pigs and, and goats in particular, and even rabbits, um, overgrazing is massive that can lead to, to erosion. But with pigs and goats in particular, they have hard hooves, which um, can cause damage to the, to the soil structure as well. And, and rabbits will dig warrens. Uh, and if it's on a hillside and you get rain events, um, they can tunnel through those warrens and, and, and cause all sorts of erosion there. Competition for food is another one. Uh, water and shelter as well. Um, so, yeah, so various food species, for example. So it, they might compete with, so foxes might compete with quolls. Um, they might eat similar food types and those sorts of things. Well, they, um, feral goats can take up massive areas uh, and live in rock, uh, rocky outcrops and those sort of things that can be quite great well, uh, wallaby habitat um, and those sorts of things. And then you have the disease transmission risk as well. Um, so some of these diseases that the invasive species can, um, I guess, carry and spread can definitely be spread to native wildlife and potentially humans and um, agriculture or so uh, sheep, cattle, those sorts of things as well. So because this is a Melbourne and all for the Melbourne Water um, presentation series, I thought I'd just focus on, on, a, on a particular species that does cause a lot of damage in water habitats or riparian habitats, and that is feral pigs. Um, you can see there's a, a, a range of different images of feral pig um, damage that I've collected over the years in some of my research. But like I say, one of the biggest one is the ground disturbance when they do dig, um, looking for various food sources, uh, roots and invertebrates and those sorts of things. You can see that there in the riparian zone of a wetland, um, but it's even out into the paddocks as well and um, pasture areas and those sorts of things. They'll target frogs. So we've done, I've done dietary analysis on feral pig stomachs in quite a few different habitats, but one was in the Macquarie marshes in New South Wales. And we, we sampled various, well, up to a hundred different feral pigs and uh, found that frogs were reasonably common within some of those stomachs. Uh, but there was also things like um, reptiles, so snakes and, and lizards and those sorts of things. Wallowing is another thing that feral pigs do. So they don't, have many sweat glands. The only sweat glands they have are a few in their snout. So the rest, they're not like us. They don't they don't sweat to cool themselves down. So a lot of the times they'll um, travel to a water point and wallow in the edges, as you can see in some of those bottom photos there, to cool down. And then they'll spend the rest of the day in the shade um, and then come out at night time to feed. And then you've also got an image down there in the bottom right of feral pigs. Um, eating ibis eggs, so ground nesting birds, but also turtles and even crocodile eggs in up north can be um, taken by feral pigs. Some damage caused by invasive species, they've got harassment and uh, predation of livestock. Um, so that's more, I guess, for foxes, wild dogs, and even feral pigs. Um, all of those species will attack and kill livestock. Some will just maim livestock and some will harass, which can cause um, problems with, with birthing and everything else. Um, they cause damage to infrastructure. So goats traveling through fences, put big holes in the fence, and then that then your stock can, can intermix with, with neighbor stock, which can cause problems with um, disease transmission and those sorts of things. Um, feral pigs will wallow in drinking troughs as well and can break the troughs, cause damage there. Um, dripper systems can be targeted as well in say uh, vineyards and those sorts of things by feral pigs. Uh, pigs and, and others will also destroy pasture and crops. Um, so pasture particularly with rabbits and, and also with pigs but um, the damage that some of these animals can cause as well to the crop is, is far more than they actually eat. So an example there is pigs only eat about 14% of what they actually destroy um, in a cropping situation. The other thing is they contribute to the uh, soil erosion. They contaminate water sources. They compete for food, water and shelter, particularly in drought time when, when times are tough. Um, there's not a lot of water or feed to go around and they certainly compete with livestock there. And again, the disease transmission is another serious problem. So why are they such a disease risk? Well, most of our pests are abundant and relatively widespread. They can travel considerable distances. 
they come into contact with people, uh, with livestock and various wildlife. They'll scavenge food sources. So, you know, even in, in towns, we'll have foxes that scavenge from rubbish tip sites and people's bins and those sorts of things. Um, but they'll also, out in an agricultural setting, take or eat carrion, which is various carcasses of, of animals, and those animals may have died because of a disease, and then they can spread that on that way. Um, they defecate, urinate in or near drinking water. I've seen that firsthand with pigs in particular, um, and that can then spread it to other stock. They're often infested with parasites, like things like ticks, um, parasitic worms, and, and those sorts of things. They don't respect property boundaries, so it's pretty hard to contain a disease if there are various invasive species in that environment that go from one property to the next. And um, a lot of these animals live in areas where mosquitoes are abundant as well, so they can feed on, on these pests and then they can feed on people or other animals. So the other impact associated with pests is the social impact. Um, it can damage the quality or way of life. So it can actually cause people to have to change what their enterprise is. Um, so particularly in the high country where wild dogs can be a real issue, it's, it's in some areas has forced people to change what they do on their land. Um, it can cause emotional harm and distress as well. So coming out and seeing 20 or, or 30 maimed sheep or, or animals uh, can be distressing. They can damage cultural sites um, and historic sites by digging and causing erosion and those sorts of things. They can cause conflict within communities. Um, the biggest one there is some people want the pests, some people don't. Um, and then you can get the, well, they're not doing anything about their pests on my land. Why should I do stuff on my, on, on my land, that kind of thing. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, they can be a valuable resource. Often it's a hunting resource. Um, so, you know, a lot of these species, including goats and pigs and foxes and, and all sorts of others are, are a bit of a prized hunting animal and um, it's a, a popular thing to do um, in Australia. So that can make it pretty difficult, um, particularly if you're looking for to eradicate or things like that. Um, so because of all the different um, damages that these pest animals cause, they've come up with a, a range of different control techniques that can be used to, to try and manage some of that damage. Um, trapping is one of the more common ones. Um, and you can use a variety, there's a variety of traps that are used, a variety of types of traps. Um, generally confinement traps and foothold traps though are the, are the types that I use, but there's restrictions on their use and everything. And it's certainly, if you're going to do trapping, you need to look at the, those regulations. Um, but here we've got a picture of a, a confinement trap with pigs. They're used commonly to, to trap pigs, but the foothold traps might be used to trap, say, foxes or wild dogs. The one in the middle is ground baiting. So baiting is another type of management used often to, to control various pest species. So you can bait foxes, um, pigs, wild dogs, and even rabbits. Uh, aerial shooting is another one that's used. It's, it's quite a good technique over sort of large areas that are relatively inaccessible and it can be used for, for fast population knockdowns. Um, usually used for, for larger mammal species like feral pigs and goats. Um, ground shooting is another one that's quite a common technique used to manage pest animals, but at a pop, it doesn't really have a population level impact um, compared to say some of those other ones that I've just mentioned, but it doesn't mean that it can't be useful if it's used in the right order and in the right manner, I suppose. Um, another thing that's done quite often for various pests is, is habitat or destruction or removal, particularly for rabbits where they rip warrens to a certain depth and in a certain method and that collapses the warrens and the warrens are very important um, for rabbit breeding and parts of their ecology. So without the warren, it's very hard for rabbit numbers to build up. Another thing is, is various weed species as well can provide habitat for all sorts of pests. Um, so things like boxthorn and blackberry and those sorts of things. Um, and then the other one is fumigation. So any of the burrowing animals like rabbits and foxes can, be, can also be fumigated. And there are particular types of fumigation techniques and, and those sorts of things that can be used. So over the years, th there have also been some, some newer developments, um, mainly to 
improve target specificity and also to improve the humaneness of various techniques and the efficacy as well. So the one in the top left there is a canid pest ejector. It was probably released in about two years ago. Quite a lot of work went into that device. Um, and essentially it's a mechanical device that's used to deliver toxins specifically to canids. So canids is wild dogs and foxes. So what happens there is the fox or the dog is attracted to that lure head that sits above the ground. And when they pull on that lure head to a certain force, the contents of a capsule is expelled into the mouth of the animal directly. And um, yeah, and that, that's how that, that particular product there works. And then you go around at the end of your program and you take a look and see which ones have been pulled and not and replace um, your, your bait capsules. The other is one in the middle up there is a, um, is a feral pig trap with remote trigger gates and also a, a feeder, an automatic feeder within it. So it's a pretty labor intensive process baiting feral pigs, but this way here can, can reduce some of that. So that feeder in the middle there is set to, to deliver grain at, at a certain time in the afternoon every day, saves a landholder having to go out and check it. And these trap gates are uh, monitored with a real time camera or a, a still camera that sends images real time to your phone. And when you see that the pigs are in the trap, you can send a text message to that receiver and that will drop the gate and ensure that you've caught those animals and all of those animals at one time, rather than the older style traps that um, rely on a door trigger mechanism that you may or may not catch the entire group. And if you don't catch the entire group, the others might, might become trap shy. Um, so the other stuff is night vision and thermal scopes. Um, a lot of our pest animals are nocturnal or at least mostly active at night time. So, so you can target them more effectively at night without the use of a light um, because some species have learned or, or animals in particular have learned to avoid spotlights or at least not look at the spotlights. Um, so that might be helpful for those situations. Uh, down the bottom left is a pig specific feeding device. So that's designed to prevent other animals from accessing bait material during a baiting program and the pigs learn how to feed out of that. It's a several stage process. But essentially, you don't put toxin out until the pigs are happily feeding out of that device um, on the non-toxic version of the bait. Um, that's, like I say, to prevent non-targeted access. Uh, the other thing that's been worked on over the years is the different types of toxins. So some new toxins have, have I guess, come onto the market relatively recently, and that's uh, PAP, for canids, so paramino propriophenone. Um, it works on the blood um, of the animal. And essentially what it does is prevents the, the body or the blood from carrying oxygen to the major, major organs and then they ultimately shut down. It works quite quickly. Um, and sodium nitride is another one. Works in a very similar manner, um, prevents the blood from carrying oxygen to, to major organs. Um, and remote cameras have been another a big thing of, of sort of recent years to help fine tune your management techniques, but also to work out whether there might be a risk to non-target species or to monitor your populations as well before and after control. So traditional management, um, this, this means more like what's been done in the past. So in the past, management often has been reactive. So you may see that crops are being damaged by pigs, for example. So you decide to, to get out there and try and fix that. Or you might start losing lambs during the lambing season and try to, to um, reduce that impact uh, of foxes. Or it might be uh, large areas of a wetland might be getting destroyed by pigs. So you try and figure out how we might fix that issue. Um, but the problem is, it's already happening and it can be very hard to stop once it's already happening, particularly if it's foxes feeding on lamb carcasses, it's gonna be very hard to, to change that feeding behavior onto a bait, for example. Um, they've often used as well, only one control technique and, and largely that's shooting, but um, yeah, often we know that, you know, you'll, you won't get every pest animal with, with one technique. You're always going to have a few that don't take a bait or that you don't see while you're shooting or that you can't trap. So using multiple techniques can help, uh, I guess, collect animals that are missed with one to um, yeah, pick them up with the next technique. 
they're often only undertaken at a small scale, at a property scale. Um, and like we said earlier, animals can have a large home range, so they can move over multiple properties. So if you're only working on your property, you can take all those animals out, and within several weeks, you'll have new ones come back in um, because they'll just move into that, that good um, feeding area where the, the good resources are and those sorts of things. Um, the other thing, little, very little monitoring was ever undertaken. Monitoring was often seen as a bit of a waste of money and time. So, you know, the thought was, well, if we've got money to, to monitor, why don't we just put more into control rather than, than the monitoring? But it's very hard to manage a pest animal if you don't even know what the problem is or, or how, you do, how you're going to deal with it or what impact you're having on that population. So monitoring is critical. Um, there was also a large focus on the numbers killed. So a lot of the time, you know, just say during an aerial shooting program, for example, we'd, they'd report on, oh, we got this many feral pigs at this time. Um, and we got this many the next time, rather than saying we reduced the population by this much because, you know, 500 pigs might might be a lot, but in one, in one situation, but it might be 2% in another situation. So yeah, it's not always about numbers killed. And the, the other thing too was to, to, the aim was often to eradicate, like completely remove, permanent and complete removal of a pest animal. Um, but we're finding that that's just rarely possible, particularly on the mainland, um, because you've always got a source of a reinvasion population, um, except for them where there might be a, an isolated population in a, in a reserve that you can't, or new animals can't immigrate from outside. Um, so eradication is still possible on islands. And, and in probably in um, uh, predator proof exclusion areas as well on the mainland because you can prevent that reinvasion. But here's the rules for eradication and, and it sort of shows why it's generally not possible on the mainland. Um, so really these are the essential things. You've got to be able to remove the, the pest faster than they can replace themselves. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, they can breed quite quickly and they can have a lot of young each time when they do breed. You also got to be able to prevent reinvasion from outside areas. Very hard to do on the mainland, um, but pot potentially on islands or in, in um, fenced areas. And you got to make sure all re reproductive animals are at risk of the control technique. So that's that sort of highlights the importance of using multiple techniques because not all animals will be exposed if you just bait, or not all of them will be exposed if you just shoot. Um, desirable considerations as well, um, that the animals can be detected at low densities. A lot of these species, particularly say foxes, for example, are very cryptic. So it's hard to know if you've gotten rid of them all, if you can't detect them when they're at low densities. And that is a, that foxes are hard to detect. Uh, the benefit of eradication outweighs the continued management. So it might cost a real lot of money to try and eradicate these pests from a particular area when the ongoing management isn't that much. So you've got to make sure that it's going to be worthwhile. Um, socio-political environment is accepting. So that was, again, what I was spoke, speaking about earlier. Um, there's always a chance that we don't want complete eradication or, not, you know, certain members of the community may not want complete eradication of a pest um, because there might be a valued hunting resource or whatever it might be. So that, that can also play a, a part in eradication. Um, so modern management, so this has sort of happened uh, probably since about the 1980s or so, started to look at things a little bit differently. Guys like Mike Brasher and, and Glenn Saunders, um, which I'll talk about in the next slide, I think, have um, spent a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to work out what makes successful programs successful. Um, what they found was it's important to identify and work with your key stakeholders. Um, so that's anyone that has a real interest in the pest animal in that particular area. Um, so it's the affected landholders, it could be local government, um, it could be hunters, it could be a whole range of different um, stakeholder groups. Understanding the biology and ecology and the behaviour of the, the pest species is critical as well. Um, so it's important that um, you understand when these pests are going to be most vulnerable at the time. So um, I often go back to pigs because I've done a fair bit of work on feral pigs over the years. But say for pigs, for example, you know that 
they, in the dry conditions, they need to drink regularly. So you can understand that and you can use that to your advantage. So if you've only got a few water points in, the, in that landscape, you know that that's where you might be able to target some of your control. Um, so for fox baiting, it might be when there's a lack of alternate feed in the landscape, that might be the best time to bait, bait foxes. Um, using suitable control techniques as well. So you need to be able to make sure that the ones that you select are suitable for the area um, and that they can achieve what you're, what you're hoping to achieve as well. Um, consider the latest and best information. So that's looking at websites, um, journal articles, talking to people as well, experts. Um, it's good, good, good website is the um, Pest Smart website, lots of information there. Um, but even our AgVic website has quite a lot of uh, information on the various pest species. Um, and making evidence-based decisions, don't be sort of knee-jerk reactions, just having a really good look. And that's where the, the monitoring can, can really help with your decision-making. Um, adopting the strategic approach, which I'll talk about soon. Um, it's just, it's essentially a framework to develop a management plan that can be used anywhere for any situation. And it helps you just tailor one to your own specific needs. Um, and aim to reduce the damage more so than to try and eradicate the pest animal. So um, if the problem is your lambing percentages, well then you, you've got to really look at that and, and look at, well, if I do this control, is that having an impact on, on my lambing percentages? Because you might find, um, that there may be specific animals within the population that are causing the damage. So if you happen to be able to remove them, then the problem's not, not longer, no longer bothering you anymore. Um, so it's just looking at it a bit differently. Um, coordinating your effort over a landscape scale as well. So that comes down to the home range and the, and the re-invasion rate. So the, the more people you get involved, the wider the area, the slower re-invasion and, and population build up is going to be. And uh, developing a suitable monitoring strategy. So when I say, you know, you got to monitor, it's, it's important to, to use techniques that suit the situation as well. They're going to give you the information that you need to make those decisions. And they don't need to necessarily be, you know, of um, research specification. It just needs to tell you what, what you need to know. And sometimes like cameras can be very useful for that nowadays. Um, they do a lot of the work for you in all honesty, and then then you just need to, to understand how to analyze those images correctly. So the strategic approach, like I said, there's been a few books that have been developed on this and uh, definitely worth, if you're in pest management, to, to get your hands on those. Um, but essentially there's seven steps. This number of steps changes a little bit from time to time and has throughout the years. Um, but essentially they're, they're the same, like the principles are the same and it's define the problem. So understanding what it is that's going on in that, that area, like um, it might be water quality, there's damage, um, reduced water quality or um, damage to habitat, damage to riparian zones, whatever it might be. It's not specifically the pest animal, it's, it's understanding the, the problem. Um, set clear, measurable and essentially achievable objectives as well. Um, they need to be measurable so you can tell whether you're actually achieving them or not, or, or on, the, on the way to achieving them. Um, develop a detailed plan of action or management plan um, that outlines the steps and the procedures to get the job done. Um, undertake a risk analysis as well before implementing anything because there is a chance that something might go wrong. So it's good to have a mitigation strategy. Um, so that might be, you know, if you're going to include baiting in your program, then you might, well, you would um, do a risk analysis there on what's the type of bait that I should use, where should I use it, um, how can I reduce the non-target impact, those kinds of things. Even taking into consideration the cost is important in the risk management um, mitigation stage, the cost of a program. You don't want the, the, the budget to blow out, you're not be able to, to do what you, you've, you set out to do. Um, and then you implement the management plan and monitor and evaluate and see if you started, if you're on target. So don't make any changes too quickly. Generally a year would be good enough and then you can revisit, sit down and, and look at your results and analyze that and, and see whether you might be able to um, improve something like cost effect, um, cost efficiency of the program, or you might be able to add another round of baiting or a bit of trapping or whatever it might be to, to improve those results. Um, and that's, that sort of brings us to step seven, which is the, 
the adaptive management, adapt where you can. So I'll go into those steps a little bit in a little bit more detail, just so it's a little bit clearer. Um, but defining the problem is, it's generally a good way to do that is to just figure out what, what the actual cause was in the first place for you to want to do something. Um, so what was the trigger? And it, like I said, it could be um, damage to pasture um, or, or crop damage or, or whatever it might be. Then who is affected? So really have a good look at, at who's affected and, and how you might engage those stakeholders. Uh, where is the problem? So this is where your mapping can be really important. So map the damage, the distribution of the of the damage but, uh, and of the pests in um, in the landscape. So then you can identify potential hotspots and where you might be able to target those pests more effectively rather than blanket approach. You could say, well, we're gonna have just as good a result if we just target this water point, this water point and this one as what we would if we did it all over the place. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, getting an idea of the um, abundance. So the number of species that are out there or the number of pests, or if you can get an idea of that um, and, and some, some measure of the damage. So in time, you can see what, what sort of a knockdown that you've had. Um, selecting the right techniques. So there's a, a range of different sources. Like I said, you can look at the, um, the AgVic website. You can look at uh, PestSmart website and others but just have a look and see what's out there for those particular pests and then review all the information on each of those techniques. And, you know, it can be written information, but you can also chat to people and see what's worked for them. Um, and then consider, is it practical um, to do what I want to do? So we might only have a small block of land that we want to do this on or a small, um, it might be a, a forest, state forest or you know, national park. So you might not, do an aerial cull because it would be a lot of money just to do that. You might be better off doing something else. So practicality is important. Can, can that particular method be used to achieve the results that you're after? Um, is it humane? It's, it's a critical thing to, to look at the humaneness and, and look at the off potential for off target. Um, and do we have the resources to be able to, to implement it to the standard that it needs to be implemented? And the species information and control calendar, this is another important thing that's good to have within a management plan because um, it can help you identify particular times of the year when you might implement each of the tools. So use each tool when, where it is most suitable. Um, and that's important to save on money and, and to improve efficacy. Consider the biology of the, and of the, uh, the non-target and the target. Um, so an example there might be, you wanted to do a fox baiting program, but you're worried about um, bait uptake by lace, uh, lace monitors, for example. So you might not bait during a time of the year when lace monitors are active. Um, but then you could also look at, well, what's the efficacy or, or what's the LD50 for, say I'm gonna use 1080, what's the LD50 for 1080 on a, on a lace monitor? And is it even gonna be a worry anyway? And, um, because lace monitors and some other native species actually do have a higher tolerance to, to 1080 compared to say foxes. Um, bait when the climatic conditions and weather are suitable or not bait, but and do implement these control when the, when the conditions are suitable. So it's pretty hard to, to bait foxes or pigs or, or even rabbits or whatever it might be when there's abundant nat natural food around. Um, you know, you want to put the ball in your court and, and make sure you get the best results. So, so do that generally when, when everything else is dried off and, and there's not a lot of good feed available. Um, look at the topography of the, the landscape, you know, that might prevent you from using certain techniques as well. It might be too hard to get in there with big trapping equipment um, or what it might, whatever that might be. Look at when and where the damage occurs to see whether you might be able to be more specific about it and just prevent that damage and then you might be okay. Um, and look at high use areas in the landscape and then you can put all this stuff down into a, um, a control activities calendar, uh, which is very useful. So before implementing a management plan, it's important to, to look at all these um, legal considerations as well. So making sure you've got the right permits and authorizations to do the techniques that you've selected, um, adhering to codes of practice and standard operating procedures. There's national codes out there that, that you can, can find um, and standard operating procedures and they help you implement a method at, at best practice. Um, you can look at 
you know, workplace health and safety plans and risk mitigation and those sorts of things, animal welfare. And then you want to establish um, notification and signage procedures where, you, where that's a requirement. Um, ensure that the relevant stakeholders are kept informed uh, and involved. Ensure that the environmental con conditions are favourable. And just making sure that everyone, or as many people as you can, can, can do this in a coordinated fashion. Uh, monitoring, I've gone on about it, but it, is, it really is critical, um, something that, that really has to be done. And there's essentially two forms of monitoring that need to be undertaken with pest management. Uh, the first is operations. So that's more about what's being done, where it was done, and how much it cost, those sorts of things. Because um, then you can fine tune your, your, your cost benefit. And the other is the performance monitoring. So that's the performance of your program in, in meeting your objectives. So um, yeah, that's things like the density damage stuff. So that's where you might do um, remote cameras or camera points or spotlight transects, those kinds of things. Um, but it's important to, to only collect what you need because monitoring can be expensive and you can go over the top with it. So just make sure that that program suits, suits your needs. Um, essentially, that's it um, in a nutshell. There's obviously a lot more, but that, I think that's a really good um, probably baseline and that could be even be used right up to, to developing an effective management plan. There's a couple of really good websites to get more information on um, the various pest species that are out there and the various control techniques and, and some of the rules and regulations. There are just about the rules and regs with most of the techniques, so please be sure that you, you, you make sure that you're, you're covering all of those. Um, so yeah, that's about it. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Yep, excellent. Thanks, Jason. We've got quite a few questions that have come up. So um, we've got a few that are around um, some other pest animals that you may not have uh, specifically mentioned. So there's a question around cats and deer. Um, being yep. included, are those included as kind of official pest animals? Uh, not deer. So deer are considered game species um, and they're listed under the Wildlife Act and not they're not managed by um, Agriculture Victoria. Um, so they're, a lot of the information through deer is, it can be found through um, DALP and, and even the GMA. Um, their, their status changes from state to state a little bit. And um, yeah, but but in Victoria, no, they're not listed officially as a as a pest animal species. Um, feral cats are listed as um, pest animal species, a declared pest species, but only on um, public land, and they are only to be managed by public land managers. Um, so on private land, they're not not officially listed as a, a declared pest animal. Cool. Um, do you have any comments? Uh, oh, hang on. Just lost that question. Um, is there much that we can do to manage animal pests within the urban areas to protect what's left of our remnant bushland and biodiversity? So uh, are there any examples of urban pest management plans that have had beneficial outcomes? Definitely. There are things you can do for sure, um, but it, urban pest management no doubt raises um, challenges because it, it does take away some of those ones that that are very useful so particularly say um baiting for example is going to be very unlikely in those areas just due to the risks um and shooting and others but you know the best thing a lot of the time in the urban environments is is to contact um your local pest control uh contractors and those kinds of people because they've often done quite a bit of it. Um, but things that can be done is in, in most situations, say if it was foxes, um, is to just make your yards as fox unfriendly as possible. So that's not leaving out dog food and scraps and not having, you know, rubbish or anything like that in the backyard and just trying to make it a place where, that a fox doesn't really want to be going to anyway. Um, but if you're having real trouble at the end, yeah, you might want to employ a, a contractor to say trap the animal. They can cage trap and, and those sorts of things in certain certain areas. Um, and and for rabbits, um, potentially there's the 
uh, the vir um, RHDV2 sort of runs through rabbit populations naturally in some areas, which can lower the rabbit populations a little bit. Um, and that doesn't af affect any other animals. Um, there could be harbour removal and harbour destruction as well for rabbits and, and potentially in some situations, maybe fumigation as well, but there is some restrictions on the use of fumigation with um, needing chemical uses permits and those sorts of things. Cool. Uh, do you have any comment to make regarding management of native animals that have become pests to, due to human alterations to environments? So for example, noisy miners in urban areas that could be impacting on smaller or other bird species. Uh, no, I, I can't really comment on 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 any of those. I, I certainly understand that that native species can become troublesome in areas, and you know it can be, um, for example, wombats can cause you know dig dig holes and cause trouble in farmland, and and, and kangaroos as well, uh, d d destroying crop and and those sorts of things. Um, but in terms of official notification as a pest, that they're, they're not. They're they're considered native wildlife and there's a lot of regulations around their management and and um, that's definitely something that you should chat to your you know local um, DALP or, or PV officers about if you're having trouble with native animals. Cool. Um, can dingoes be classified as a native species and a wild dog in different regions? Yeah the dingo dog wild dog one is a is a complicated one so um, feral dogs, so that's um, sort of domestic dog breeds that have gone feral and living in the wild is classified as a wild dog. Um, and then you have the hybrids of dingoes and those dogs classified as a wild dog, but there are dingoes and they are listed as um, wildlife under the Wildlife Act. But there are particular areas where they're protected and particular areas where they're not. Um, and the, and for more information on those areas, best again to, to look at the, the DALP website. And there's a little bit in there actually on AgVic website too um, around the bounty and where, where wild dogs can be taken from. But essentially there's a couple of areas in the state, one in the west and one in the, in the east where there's a buffer zone where um, dingoes are listed as, as unprotected in, in order to um, allow graziers to, to manage wild dogs in, in those interface areas to prevent livestock losses. Um, but, but it's been really worthwhile um, doing some more reading on that because it's hard for me to explain all that stuff off the top of my head and there's a fair bit to it. Cool. Uh, there's a question around um, off-target impacts of uh, poisons. Uh, so I think it's particularly about if there's a poison pest that is then eaten by a non-target species. So um, going up in that food chain or being you know taken up by carrion eaters. Yep. Um, so there is a chance of that. Um, the, the, the baiting situation is a, is a complicated situation, but it, look, it, various species have various sensitivities to different toxins. Um, like I mentioned earlier, 1080 is a naturally occurring substance in our um, in the Australian environment, it occurs in several different plant species. So there are native species and quite a few native species that are less sensitive to 1080 than, than introduced species that haven't evolved with it in the landscape. So cats, foxes, rabbits, and those are quite, quite sensitive to 1080. Um, so in, in those situations, say if there was an animal that was going to scavenge, which would be a, um, a goanna or a, an eagle, a bird of prey, for 1080, those animals have, um, quite, have quite low sensitivity to 1080, so they're generally okay with scavenging carcasses. Um, but then you have other toxins as well, like um, the new ones that are out, so sodium nitrite or, or PAP. Um, they're generally metabolised quite quickly within the animal that eats it before, prior to death, so the, the actual residue levels are quite low. Um, in, in those particular, with, for those particular toxins, and there's actually quite a low risk of secondary target or secondary poisoning. Um, it was more some of the older toxins that had been used historically um, in other parts of Australia and, and some other states where um, it can stay in the environment for quite a while, um, and those have often been banned or discontinued in their use. But, but there's always a risk with non-target damage, but that's why some of those um, 
things have come onto the market as well or, or become available to prevent some of that from actually happening. Thanks. Uh, I've got a couple of questions about rabbits. Um, have you had much success with the new Khaleesi virus strain for rab rabbits? Um, so the Khaleesi virus, one, it's, a, it's a quite a, um, a long story and a big story, but I'll try and condense it as much as I can. Um, so initially back in 96, the um, Czech strain was released and it had a really good knockdown on rabbits in, in the Australian, in most of the Australian landscape, apart from the wetter regions, I suppose you would say. And what we found much later on was that there was a benign form of the virus that, that occurred in those regions that was giving the rabbit some immunity um, to the original Czech strain. Um, so what the scientists did and the researchers did was try and find a different strain of the same virus that would um, target those particular rabbits in those areas, still target the other ones as well, but be more effective in those areas that could overcome that immune response um, from, the, from that endemic virus. And they did that. And that was one that was from Korea and that was uh, released in about 2016, 17. Um, with mixed results, so it depends a lot on, on what's going on in the environment at, at the time, but up, up to 35 to 40% knockdown was recorded with that one. And that's the one, that's K5 virus is the one that you can still buy and, and release at particular times. It's, it's best to, to do that um, in, in autumn if you're going to, um, but I wouldn't rely on it as the only method to control rabbits. Um, it's just a helpful additional tool. Um, all the, while all this was going on as well, they, they found a, uh, a rogue form of the virus that nobody knows where it came from. And it's referred to as RHDV2. And this is probably the dominant strain of virus in the landscape at the moment. And this can have um, population knockdowns of 50 to 60%. They've found at a lot of um, study sites across the country. And it's actually having um, a reasonable impact on, on rabbit numbers and that, that you can't buy at the moment or anything like that. It's just naturally occurring. And it, it, that's might be why you see rabbits sort of ebb and flow. The populations a little bit would be more so because of the RHDV2 rather than the, the K5 that was just released. But yeah, again, that one's a, a complicated one and definitely there's quite a bit more information on the website on that. If you'd like to, to, to learn a little bit more about that. Last one. Um, and can you provide any information about fumigating rabbits? Uh, yep. So there's only one type of fumigant that's used and that's aluminium. No, 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 um, yes. Aluminium phosphide um, at the moment. And you do need your A cup to use that. And that's where um, they're like a little uh, tablet thing, I suppose it is. Um, and you fill in the, the, rabbit, the various rabbit holes and you put a couple of those tablets in each one. And um, there's a lot more to it than that, but I'm just basically going through it. Um, and then that fumigates the, the warren. And that's generally best used after a ripping program. So you go through, rip the warrens. So you do you crush the population first with, with baiting, and then you'd rip, and then you'd fumigate any warrens that reopen. Um, and that's, that's generally the best way to do that. So after your ripping program, go around and have a look it, it, after a little while. If there's any reopens, then just just fumigate because it's, it's an, a big process and you wouldn't want to do it straight away. And, and the structure of the warren essentially is still there if you only fumigate, you know, so the, the eventually rabbits will reopen and reuse those warrens. Um, so best thing is to, to destroy the warren completely and then, then fumigate afterwards, any reopenings. Cool. Uh, for a very broad question, are you optimistic about progress in the eradication of pests in Australia? Um, and also with monitoring programs and the cost is the use of volunteers such as the citizen science program an option? Eradication of pests in Australia off the mainland. I'm not optimistic about that. Um, with the current techniques, I just, we, you know, and going and sort of going back to some of the things I mentioned in, in my presentation, I think a lot of these pest animals are going to be here to stay unless there are some changes out there. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't, reduce the impacts that they have to an acceptable level. And it doesn't mean that we can't aim for local eradication of certain species. Um, so like I said earlier, there might be an area um, where this particular population of pests are isolated because it's, um, it's in a, a park and it's surrounded by open country. So, you know, if it was feral goats in that particular park, you might be able to get rid of them completely and prevent reinvasion. Um, I do think you could 
look at um, reducing or eliminating feral or pest animals off islands for sure because you can prevent uh, reinvasion there. Um, so yeah, unlikely to have like Australia-wide eradication um, anytime soon. But like I said, we can we can look at reducing the the impacts for sure. Um, citizen science, I think, is really good that that um, Khaleesi virus or the RHDV K5 release. There was a large component of that was citizen science, and that was what helped everyone get a better understanding of the effect of that virus across the state or across the country, actually. I think it was you know, 500 sites or something that were monitored by um, various landholders around the place. So that was a really successful monitoring program. And definitely I see it be helpful um, in other areas too. So particularly now with the use of remote cameras, um, it takes a long time to analyze photos and those sorts of things. So citizen science could be great there. They could certainly help um, analyze photos and look at you know densities and, and those sorts of things. So yeah, I, I think volunteer work and everything's great where it can be implemented you know, in a strategic manner. It might also bring up the Pest Smart app as well that's available. So that could be a way that you know volunteers could contribute information in terms of locations of pest species that uh, public land managers might be able to use for their their activities. Certainly. So that's the um, feral scan, um, and you can get that through the PestSmart website. It's a, a modern or a tool to, that's been developed through the Centre of Invasive Species Solutions to um, to help map con control works, damage, those sorts of things. It's an interactive mapping program. Um, anyone can download it, and, and you can add information on sightings and all that. So that's a that's a great thing. It can it can it can really help us to understand where these where these problems are and, and, and those sorts of things. Could or should sporting shooters and hunters improve their contribution to helping to control pest animal species? So for example, through initiatives like the Farmer Assist Program with the Sporting Shooters Association? I think definitely um, shooters have a role to play in pest animal management. Like I said, you know, in all situations, we should be looking to do an integrated pest management approach and that's using all the techniques that, that are available to us and that suit the area some you can't use for, for various reasons but you know the more techniques you can use in a particular area um, the better and and they need to be delivered in a way that one's not going to affect the other so it's about working out the sequence and, and when to get in there with with shooting so you might not do shooting prior to prior to your baiting program because you know that could disrupt the behavior of the animals and impact your bait take but shooting could be a very good one to implement after that to um to take out any animals that wouldn't take your bait for whatever reason um so i, I, I do think it could be used in certain in certain situations for sure um and 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 like i say it shooting is an important part of an integrated approach um, this might be a bit outside of your wheelhouse, but uh, do you know the fine for killing native wildlife or if it's often enforced? No, I don't. I can't, can't answer that one, but I'm sure. Um, I think it's through DELP. Um, they probably have information on, on all of that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't know. Um, do you know anything about the rules for um, potentially threatened species that could be considered a, a, a pest? So um, the example that's been uh, put in chat is about grey hooded flying fox uh, within places like botanic gardens. So they're considered a threatened species that may have been causing extensive tree damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, it's a, that's a tough one for me to answer. My, my main space is in the established pest animal space. So they're the ones that are um, listed under the Catchment and Land Protection Act as a pest um, that that must be managed. Those ones, I'm not sh not quite sure. I, I, you know, I'd be just. Um, I think the best thing to do again is is probably just to talk to the the, the DELP representatives and, and on how they go about managing overabundant natives. Cool. Uh, we've got one last question here. So are landholders, in your opinion, uh, are landholders being responsible enough regarding pests on their properties or do you think they might be too reliant on the Department of Agriculture? 
Oh, that's a tough one. There's definitely um, lots of people and lots of farmers out there that do fantastic work on um, pest management, no doubt about it. And, and that's fantastic to see. And I'd love to see that more, more often. And, and, you know, that's part of our role is to, is to um, help educate and support that community led action where we can. So um, that's why we're here. And, and, you know, sometimes pests aren't being managed on, on certain areas just because it's not known the damage that they're causing is maybe not known or it's a little bit, or how to go about managing them is not known. So hopefully with things like this that we've done today um, and, and others as well, and just, you know, these education and training days and those sorts of things that we can, we can all um, start to understand what needs to be done and how and where and when to get, to get the best results we possibly can. Great, thanks very much. Um, yes, yeah, hit the end of the question, so I'll hand over to Teresa to wrap things up for us. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Jason. That was a really great presentation. So I'm just going to share my screen um, so you, everyone can see what we've got coming up next for our webinars. So hopefully you can all see that. So um, on the 1st of October, we've got CARP, a 50 year history of environmental impact. And that's going to be a talk by Ivor Stewart from the uh, Arthur Ryler Institute. And there's going to be a bit of a change as that will be our last fortnightly webinar. And from there on in, we'll be running them every four weeks. So the one after that will be Thursday, the 29th of Ox October, and we just need to confirm that. So just keep your eye out on the Expert Connections webinar page, and we'll also be advertising that as well. So just to remind you that the recording will be on the website and we'll can notify you by email when it then becomes available. And if you have any more questions or queries, then just email us at waterwatch at melbournewater.com.au. And I'd just like to say thank you again to Jason. It's been really great having you today, Jason, and, and really informative and really interesting. So thank you so much. And no worries. My, Thanks for having me. Thank you. And yeah, just thank my co-hosts and, all, and also the audience as always. Thank you for coming along and showing your support. It's really great to see um, your interest in these areas. So thank you. Take care, everyone, thank and you. see you next time. See ya. <laughs>